Thank you for joining us. Among the many subjects we cover, one of the most important concerns is certainly that of our health. The most important conference on age reversal just took place here in Las Vegas at the beautiful Westgate Resort and Conference Center. Over 1,000 people attended this Revolution Against Aging and Death conference with prominent scientists, doctors and authors, including Dr. Bill Andrews, Dr. Sandra Kaufman, Liz Parrish and Suzanne Summers, among the world-famous featured speakers. We'll begin with a keynote presentation by Bill Falloon. Welcome the director and co-founder of Life Extension Foundation, Bill Falloon. Thank you so much. Group, I want you to know that every PowerPoint I'm going to show is on the agereversal.net. Every single one. So it gives you an opportunity to pay attention to what I'm saying, because on this website, this entire PowerPoint and others are there for your viewing. Now, in about 15 minutes, I'm going to make an announcement that is unprecedented in the history of medical science. In fact, what you're going to learn at RADFest this weekend is unparalleled in the history of the human race. Before we delve into the science, I want to put into context where we are today compared to 10 years ago. This is a group of people who attended the Manhattan Beach Longevity Summit in November 2009. We gathered this group of mostly scientists to identify just one intervention that could reverse a pathological aging mechanism. We were just seeking something, one way for us to grow a little younger because we were all, unfortunately, aging to death. So we had a really nice logo made, Nuke Aging. And we used Manhattan Beach Project to make it analogous to the, uh, well, the Manhattan Beach Project in Los Alamos, New Mexico. We were in a hurry. So the goal, one intervention to reverse aging. We've got 55 mostly scientific people together. There was no registration fee for this, by the way. Life Extension paid for the hotel, the travel, the meals, everything. We paid $60,000 to get this group of scientists together because, hey, we were aging to death and nothing could be done to reverse it. And after three straight days, absolutely nothing. Nothing that we could validate that could make an older person grow biologically younger. That was the harsh reality. It was total desperation 10 years ago at the Manhattan Beach Conference. Absolute disaster. Move forward to 2019. You get the covers of prestigious scientific magazine talking about a cure for biological aging. And it has a lot to do with what I'm going to tell you about tonight. A cure for biological aging. 2009, nothing. And look at where we are. You go to the airport, you may see this Time Magazine special edition. It's all about rapamycin and a number of other therapies that you are familiar with. And what they say in this magazine is that aging is no longer a dreadful inevitability. It's just a puzzle that can be solved, just like a disease. And look at what we're doing right now. This puzzle. That involves 10 different age reversal interventions that our Life Extension Group, the Age Reversal Network, a number of other charities, we have studied some of these, or all of them in one way or another, in humans, and we're seeing results. So what is being talked about in the media is being done right now by people in this room. It's absolutely spectacular. And the concept of living for an indefinite period of time, it's now appearing in prestigious scientific journals. The reporters talk to the scientists who are making aging in reverse in the laboratory. They're talking to me about what we're doing with human studies, and they're realizing that people are going to start living a real long time. The prospect of immortality, it's no longer science fiction. It is turning into scientific reality, and the media is picking up on it. I'm going to tell you why in just a few minutes, but they're picking up on the fact that aging is going to be conquered very, very soon. We are cheating aging every single day, and most of you are doing that with how you delay it with the various interventions that you utilize, but we're, we need to move it backwards because we can't just slow down something forever. We need to put it in reverse. Now, if you look at where we were, wow, a terrible time 10 years ago. Move forward just 10 years. Major, major advances that occurred. Major, major advances. And we're looking at the conferences right now. If you wonder why there's not 5,000 people in this room, by the way, well, there are 
30 rated longevity conferences around the country, around the world, and those conferences are listing RadFest. And the money is pouring into venture capital firms and scientists' hands who are seeking to find a cure for aging. This girl, Laura Deming, she started when she was 23 years of age. She's now managing a portfolio of $37 million invested in a number of companies seeking to keep you alive indefinitely. We are robbing people from conventional companies. They're joining companies like Life Biosciences. They raised $75 million. Now that's as of March. I've heard tonight from Aubrey de Grey that they've been raising a lot more than $75 million. Their objective of raising all this money, find a way to reverse aging in all of us. That is their objective. And Alex Zavaronikov, this is an example of someone who never stops working to find a cure for aging. I've known him for a number of years. Back about four or five years ago, our Life Extension Group invested about $140,000 into his in silico medicine group. And since then, he's raised many more millions. And just recently, he's raised $37 million to do all types of research. And I, I point this out because $140,000 a couple of years ago, it, it was a significant amount but he's transformed that into something much bigger and it shows how a little bit of money now can grow into something absolutely huge absolutely huge and the all-time leader at the moment as far as fundraising Jim Mellon, he talked at RadFest this year. His juvenescence group has raised $165 million as of this date. And I also heard from people that he's gone well above that in fundraising. And he put $20 million of his own money into these technologies so that we can all live to be at least 150 years of age. So if you look at what's going on, how humanity has been able to expand, and by the way, this was the Wall Street Journal uh, just a couple of months ago reported that the number of people living to age 100 and above has doubled. Wow, absolutely doubled. A two and a half fold increase in the number of people who are reaching that centenarian status and above. And look what they're projecting. By year 2030, there will be nearly a five-fold increase in the number of Americans living to age 100 and above, and that is without the age reversal technologies you're going to learn about this weekend. Just with improvements in conventional medicine, we're going to have a record number of centenarians by year 2030, and it's going to go way beyond that. Now, I want to put some context into this. It's very important. From 1980 to 2000, there were massive improvements in the relative number of Americans living to age 100. But look at 2000, it started to drop. What happened around 2000? Well, obesity. We've got an epidemic of obesity. You look at the maps on the screen. 1994, there wasn't a whole lot of it. 2000, people started getting heavier and more diabetic. And then 2015, it's like a plague that swept the United States. That those dark red areas indicate the percentage of people diabetic and obese. It's an absolute travesty. And it's circumventing the ability of most people to enjoy a lot longer life. And as it relates to losing weight, I know it's challenging. We're gonna help you out here a little bit. But your rate of cancer turns out is much higher than what they previously projected. They've always known obese people have greater cancer risk. This study just two months ago showed the risk of cancer far higher in obese individuals. And if you want to maintain healthy neurological function, well, if you're obese, you have a three and a half fold increase in your risk of developing dementia. All kind of good reasons to want to shed belly fat or total fat, good reasons. Now, I'm going to report a little bit on our rapamycin clinical trial. This was initiated about a year and a half ago. The dosage was what we recommended here at RadFest for people to consider, five milligrams of rapamycin just once a week. We recruited people from our age reversal network, and there were about 20 overweight people. 14 concluded. No one dropped out because of side effects, by the way. But here was the big problem. We had, unfortunately, major fires in California. And it caused there's such stress that they couldn't really deal with their health because their houses were burning down. They were inhaling smoke. But what we were able to see in this rapamycin study were significant reductions in the visceral fat mass. 
very, very important. If you're going to live to be 100 or older, you've got to shed belly fat. And this dose of rapamycin showed those indications. And in people who were in the non-smoke affected areas who were in this trial, the rapamycin was demonstrating some uh, indicators of age reversal. So this study is going to get published very soon, and then we're going to send it out to everyone in this room. But the good news is the rapamycin experimental dose of 5 milligrams just once a week, well tolerated, and yet we knew high stress. We found that high stress offset many of the benefits of this regenerative technique. So this is our revised stair-step approach to biological age control. Activate AMPK, and I bet almost everyone in this room is doing that one way or another. You're taking metformin. You're using curcumin, green tea, gynostema pentaphylum. You're using interventions to activate cellular AMPK, which is real good for you. Second step, synolytics. You want to reduce your senescent cell burden. The current gold standard protocol is desatinib and coercetin, and a lot of you are doing that. I've done it a couple times since last year's RADFest. We, of course, want to restore youthful NAD levels and autophagy. That's that cellular junk that, occur, that builds up inside our cells that Aubrey de Grey has talked about for decades. And the problem was we couldn't do much about it. Well, rapamycin helps to remove that cellular debris so that our cells can start functioning in a more youthful manner. So you go steps one through four and biologics. Well, those are exosomes, stem cells, stem cell mobilized plasma, all kinds of techniques to then truly rejuvenate you in a meaningful way. But steps one through four, very important. And if we do all this, we think we're going to make it to 2030. CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology will then likely be the ultimate cure for biological aging. Now, a lot of people ask, you know, I'm going to grow older. How am I going to feel? Well, a study came out in the Lancet, very interesting this year, that people have a lot of control over how they're going to feel. This slide makes it a lot easier to understand. If you live in Papua New Guinea and you're 46 years old, you have the age-related health problems of a 65-year-old. It's kind of scary. 46 and you're degenerating. You feel old, you've got medical issues. But if you live in Japan, you don't start feeling 65 until you're 76. That's a 30-year gap. And that tells us we have a tremendous amount of control right now over how long we live and how soon we develop degenerative illnesses. And if you wonder where the United States ranked, pretty bad. 54th on this list of countries where people experience age-related health problems either early in life or much later. And that's pretty bad. But don't worry just because you're in the United States, most of you. Not a big deal. A lot of it is where you live. And there are huge variances in stroke incidence. It really shows that different parts of the country, they have very low rates of cardiovascular disease, stroke, cancer, dementia, because they take care of themselves. And that map, the deep purple areas, are where people are having lots of strokes, lots of heart attacks. And if you look at those areas, you understand these people smoke tobacco. They eat horrifically. They're obese. They, don't, they have low socioeconomic status in many cases. They're having strokes a lot earlier than typical Americans who take care of themselves. So if you want to join the surging numbers of Americans living to 100 and over without anything we're going to talk about this year, just to, to have a chance to make it, you've got to take care of yourself. The data is incredible. And the incredible news also is the business community is waking up to this. And I've never seen this before, and I've been doing this professionally since 1977. But the greatest investment that the mainstream financial houses are talking about are companies that are working to delay human death. I haven't heard that before. That's, that's really a whole new uh, thing for me. And it's also in this article, death delaying technologies is where money is being poured into. Because with people living older, they're going to want to feel healthier. They're going to feel better. And this is one way to make that happen. And if you wonder why we're getting so much positive media, why we're getting so much recognition, well, a lot of it's in the peer-reviewed published scientific journals. They're reporting on what you learned at RADFest in 2016, 2017, 2018. They're reporting on it. And business people are looking at this thinking, wow, we're eventually going to make people grow younger. There's a lot of money to be made there, and that's why a lot of money is going into these projects. Problem is, it's not going to benefit most of us in this room because they're going through standard approval processes. That could take five years, 10 years, 15 years. We don't have that kind of time to wait. So with all this technology coming out, Harvard talking about finding a DNA switch 
that can re enable whole body regeneration. That came out this year. It's just absolutely incredible. And the Salk Institute, using some CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology early on, and they took a group of progeroid mice who were on the verge of death, and they completely rejuvenated them. It was incredible. This was in the media, and the, the mice lived longer, but they looked at their internal organs, and they grew younger simply by removing senescent cells using CRISPR-Cas9 therapy. A major, major breakthrough barely made it into the media. And the good news is, with major institutions like Harvard being able to use NAD boosting therapies, that's David Sinclair at Harvard, he talks about that all the time, does a great job on it. And then Dr. Barzelli at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, a metformin advocate, we're getting the publicity we need to carry this through to the next level. A lot of people are now are taking metformin. Uh, for those who, who don't know, by the way, our life extension group recommended it to our members in our magazine uh, 24 years ago, March 1995 issue. FDA went berserk, by the way, went absolutely berserk over the fact we were telling people to import metformin, because back then it was expensive, and just start taking it to slow your rate of aging. And now the data on it is really, really strong. I've been getting some interesting media coverage. Last year I talked about the popular science calling me the forever man, because they would interview scientists who were reversing aging in animals. But these scientists didn't have the vision to realize that what they were doing in the laboratory is going to be translated into clinical practice, and people are going to start reversing their aging process. And because of that popular science article, well, I've gotten a lot of nice publicity, a lot of nice interviews, and last month, the cover of MIT Technology Review, the cover proclaims, old age is over. And that was based on a lot of interviews. Yeah, it's incredible. MIT. They proclaimed it was over, and they poked a little fun at it, too. But you know what? They gave RadFest coverage. In one of the most respected scientific publications out there, they gave RadFest coverage, and they talked about my perpetual clinical trial. And at the top of this is if you want it. They were questioning whether people would really want to rejuvenate their bodies and grow biologically younger. They were questioning it, but they realized that I was going to try to make that happen. And so they gave us some nice publicity. Some of you may know, back in 2013, I did something rather unusual. Uh, beyond our life extension group, our age reversal network, I set up the Church of Perpetual Life. And it's accomplished exactly what I expected it to do. It's garnered media attention from around the world. This is a picture from the news uh, documentary Galileo. It is the most significant documentary series in German-speaking Europe. And they did a two-day interview with me at my house, at the church, and I had people from Germany calling me up and say, Bill, we just saw you on TV. And it was incredible. We're infiltrating the world. Pretty much every country or continent has had people at the Church of Perpetual Life covering what we do. Now, if we have the ability for whole body regeneration, which Harvard might be on the verge of making that happen, we certainly want to maintain youthful cognitive function. One of those areas that we have to support is our microglial cells. Now, these are cells that support our neurons. They, they enable the brain to protect itself against infections, and most importantly, they clean up the toxins that build up around our neurons with aging that create cognitive impairment and dementia and that sort of thing. In this study, which is so fantastic, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about it. They transplanted young bone marrow into old mice, and this is the results that they got. We talked about synapses there, but this is the result. This is the one slide I really wanted you to see, because on the far left is a young mouse with dendritic synaptic branches, just sprouting from it, like a healthy young person. But the old mouse, it's a, it's a shriveled cell, like a shriveled person with sarcopenia, osteoporosis. So they took old bone marrow and put it into old mice, and they didn't see anything, no improvement in the microglial cell health. But when they took young bone marrow, transplanted that into older mice, they were able to completely rejuvenate the microglial cells. That box to the far right in red. That's an old mouse with young bone marrow, and its microglial cell is identical to that of a young mouse. And as it relates to activity, that young bone marrow put into the old mice, wow, what a major, major improvement. 
hard to imagine something working this well. The young mouse, the upper gray box, running around the cage, very active, but the old mouse not doing it so much. But that bottom box with the red around it, that's the activity level of an old mouse with young bone marrow. This is so critical to understand that this study demonstrated how we can reverse aging. Not that people should do this right now, but you're going to learn from a number of people on this stage how you may be able to emulate these kinds of incredible findings. Johnson Johnson's putting money into research like this. A Stanford scientist, they transfused serum from a 12 to 15 month old mouse, uh, and that's middle age, by the way, 12 to 15 months, and it reversed some signs of brain aging. But guess what? When they took very young serum, very young serum, and put it into older mice, they had almost complete rejuvenation of their brain. These synaptic branches, dendritic branches, improvements in synaptic function, all of this with very young blood. And to put it into context, you can see what a 15-month mouse looks like to the right, and they look pretty old, even though they're only in mid-age. But look at that 15-day-old mouse, very small. It's blood biochemistry, very, very different. And what we're going to show you is that there are actually two proteins in very young blood that were probably responsible for that rejuvenating effect. Two proteins, thrombospodin-4, spark-like protein-1, and the great news is they can make them in the laboratory. There are recombinant proteins that they can make, which means you, you don't have to go out and rob nurseries. You can hopefully, within the next year or two, have these proteins put into your body and enjoy some spectacular brain rejuvenation. And by the way, nobody should be transplanting young bone marrow into their bodies now. That's because, unlike mice, we are not genetically identical. And if you were to undergo a bone marrow transplant, you, you risk graft versus host. So you're going to get to hear a lot of speakers this weekend talking about exosomes. You're going to hear Dr. Maharaj at Rad City talking about bone marrow stem cell stimulation in a way you can emulate many of the benefits that they show in a mouse model in humans and do it safely. We're growing old, frail, we take a fall, we break a bone, and our risk of death is really, really high. 50% risk of death in certain people who take falls. Well, the good news is that when young bone marrow stem cells are put into the site of the injury in a mouse, a remarkable improvement in the rate of healing. And that's very important, because an older person, when you take the fall, the fall itself doesn't kill them, per se. It's that months after month of being laid up, being immobilized. People develop sepsis, pneumonia, problems develop. So this is a very important uh, development for the people who develop a fracture. Very, very important. Now, everyone likes the concept of young stem cells, but what actually happens from the bone marrow is those stem cells differentiate into progenitor cells that then differentiate into functional cells, which we need, that then result in healthy tissues. This is something very important. And progenitor cells can self-renew or they can differentiate into a healthy cell that enables your organs to function. And again, bone marrow is where the stem cells are produced that we all want lots of, and stem cells produce all kinds of good cells. And this slide also indicates that when we have a healthy progenitor cell, it can produce another healthy progenitor cell. It can actually self-renew or differentiate into a functional somatic cell. Our stem cells, they age just like our somatic cells. And when we're 60, 70, 80, we still retain a lot of those stem cells. Uh, they're just getting old. But if you activate AMPK, which most of you are already doing, by activating AMPK, you suppress excess mTOR C, replenish your NAD levels. I know most of you are doing that, and activate sirtuin proteins. Resveratrol does that, by the way. By doing that, you can help restore the health of your stem cells. It's really spectacular what can be done uh, with what you're doing already. And if you are going to undergo a stem cell therapy, well, if you do all this, it's, you're going to get a better result. Harsh reality, 90% of people at 65, you know what, we've got health problems. Usually it's multiple health problems. And that gets in the way. If we're going to achieve a house of optimal health, we do need a foundation. That's absolutely critical. Before we move to the top, we need a foundation. So bottom level is what you already should be doing. 
keeping your blood pressure in low normal ranges. You want to make sure your glucose, your lipids, your homocysteine, you want that in optimal ranges so that when you graduate into the age reversal interventions, you have a hospitable body that's going to enable those interventions to work better. And we have people, by the way, who aren't controlling their blood pressure. They've got LDL particles that are way too high, and then they want to rush into a, an age reversal intervention. And I have to tell them, get level one. Perfect level one, because we can do that already. And then move into the experimental age reversal interventions that we're working on right now. So again, our current stair-step approach to biological age control, activating APK, you can do that, by the way, without taking anything. If you just restrict your calorie intake, do intermittent fasting uh, most of the week, you'll boost AMPK. If you don't want to restrict your calorie intake, metformin, nutrients like curcumin, and aerobic exercise. These are ways that you can boost your AMPK levels. There's probably nothing more important than almost every one of you in this room should be doing, because I'm trying to look for some young people, it may not pertain to them. We accumulate senescent cells as we age. We've known that forever, and we couldn't do anything about it. But the, the good news is there are therapies that we're validating that are going to reduce the senescent cell burden in your body. And by doing that, you're going to have a greater state of health because what these senescent cells do is they emit chronic inflammatory signals, and they also emit protein-degrading enzymes, metalloproteinases they're called, and they literally eat away at healthy cells that are surrounding them. So if you're going to do any kind of age reversal intervention, you need to reduce the senescent cell burden. And this photograph has appeared a lot in the media. You can see a normal aged mouse. It's like a normal aged person. It's got lots of health problems, and it looks old, and it's unhealthy. When they started treating a group of mice with senolytics starting in mid-age, they did not have these problems and they lived a lot longer. So in the animal model, that's been proven over and over again. But what we've discovered this year is that there are potent anti-cancer properties to senolytics. They can probably reduce your risk of developing cancer. And just think, by reducing the inflammatory burden, you reduce a major factor involved in malignancies developing and progressing. So this science article had a very in-depth interviews with the experts in senolytics, and they felt that if, you're, if you have cancer already, the senolytics might be an effective adjuvant therapy in addition to everything else you're doing. So this is really, really exciting. And as it relates to heart failure, 8 million Americans suffer chronic heart failure. The official data is a little bit over 5 million, but there are really over 8 million Americans. And the great news is this year is we're finding that the removal of senescent cells improves the recovery in mice with damaged cells. And then when we looked at the humans, and bear in mind, I want to repeat that we like to have a lot of healthy progenitor cells. And in doing so, well, we're able to regenerate our heart in a lot of different ways. So again, this is the charity that's going to fund this research going on, we hope, in perpetuity. And I want to thank everyone for their support of Life Extension over the last 42 years. That's why we have RadFest. I was able to get this up off the ground with Jim and so many others, with the people on Limited Group. So thank you very much, and I'll be looking forward to interacting with as many people as I can this weekend. This brings us to the end of our special show for today. I'm Richard Peretz. Thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.